introduction. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Everybody got that message, so we're good. Um, so I'll introduce our iBiomed directors. Uh, we have Dr. Hubert De Bruyne, who's our outgoing co-director for BME. We have Dr. Greg Wool, who's our incoming co-director for BME. Uh, we have Dr. Michelle McDonald, who's our co-director for HESI. Uh, Dr. Colin McDonald, who is our associate director for BME. And Dr. Alex Drosos, who's our associate, associate director for FHS. Uh, so now I'll introduce the iBiomed staff members. We have Sina Lee, who's our academic advisor. Brennan Connery, who is our academic advisor as well. Parm Bola, who's our instructional assistant. Melissa Weldon, who's our communications and engagement coordinator. Uh, there's myself, Alessandra DiBiazzi, who's the instructional coordinator. Kyle McGowan, who's our administrative assistant. Alida Oganal, who's our student program support assistant. And uh, finally, I'll introduce our iBiomed instructors by level. So uh, level one, we have our 1P10, uh, Colin McDonald and Kyla Sask. Uh, for level two, we have 2P03, Vince Lung. 2E06, Sean Park. Uh, for our level three, we have 3A03, Ian Bruce, 3E06, Anna Coral, 3P04, Chin Fang, and Janie Wilson. And then for level four, we have 4A03, Jake Neath, 4B03, Greg Wool, 4C03, Carol Bastam, 4D03, Mike Noseworthy, 4E06, Kenneth Owen. 4FO4, Hubert De Bruyne, and 4PO4, Faye Gang. And finally, our health side, 2FO3 and 2FF3, which is our anatomy course, um, Alana Bayer. Okay, thanks guys. So before we get started on answering the submitted questions, uh, we do have our HESI co-director, Michelle McDonald, who would just like to give a brief introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Al and Kyle, for organizing this. And thank you to everyone, all of our instructors for being here, all of our Student Society members who were here today, I saw it, and all of our students who tuned in today. So thank you. Um, just before we get started, I just want to let you know that we have been working so hard. We, the, the royal we, all of us at the university have been working so hard to get things underway. The, the very nice thing is that we had a bit of a test drive at the end of term two. And so um, we got some best practices under our belts and we're sharing that with all of our faculty members. Um, so some lessons learned there. Um, we also have wonderful supports at the university and within both faculties to help facilitate all of this. Just so you know, that's getting underway um, right now as we speak. Um, we have people like Vince Leung, who is um, part of the support team for the Faculty of Engineering, who's here today, and fortunately one of our instructors, um, so he'll, um, he'll be tuning in and letting you know what's going on. Um, what else is on my list of things that I wanted to say? Um, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that even in a very small class of 14 people, let alone a class of 150 people, everyone's got different preferences and different learning styles and, and different things that work best for them. And so for sure, our best practice is going to be to appeal to everyone really broadly and make sure that we, we, we do something in their classrooms or virtual classrooms that works for as many people as possible. It's really hard to make everyone happy and, um, but we'll try our best. Um, even faculty have different preferences and, and we'll have to recognize that, but we're all here, we're all learning, we're all working really hard. I just set up my first Zoom meeting today, so I'm still learning and working hard. Um, and just lastly, we might not get to all of your questions today because it looks like we have lots of people who have shown up, so I'm really happy for that. If we don't get to your question or you want to chat with us offline afterwards, please do follow up. And that's all. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Michelle. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we're going to move on now to our Q&A. Um, so we'll, we'll start off with the questions that were submitted through our website. Um, so we'll go over the more course-related questions right now. Uh, so the first one, um, can you tell us 
how you've adapted your course for an online offering. And um, so we have either Michelle, Greg, or Hubert who can answer the question. So I can, I'll, I'll start with that. And then, okay. <clears throat> so I can tell you that uh, a lot of my course um, information, you guys will be taking, uh, so the, I guess those that are going to level four um, will be taking uh, IBHS 4B03, the biomechanics course. Mm -hmm. And so I put a lot of my stuff online anyway, and I have a lot of my information on Avenue, and I'm going to continue to do that to use Avenue as the base shell for my information. Uh, I'm going to be delivering live lectures, so this is what we call synchronous lectures, um, uh, and then recording the information during the live lectures to, to give to the students. I'm gonna be changing some of my assessments a little bit to try and, and, and reduce the load from uh, uh, testing and a little bit more into assignments. Um, but I guess trying to also, you know, look for accommodations where, where necessary, where students have challenges with, um, with a streaming um, and, and that sort of stuff. And so, so trying to adapt a little bit um, to, to make sure. So as much as live is, I think live is actually quite important uh, for scheduling um, and keeping everyone on top of things. But I also think that that saving and and, and storing the data for people who need to da uh, download it offline or <clears throat> not so much offline, I guess, asynchronously is al is also very important. So those are some of the key changes I'm going to be working on. I'm going I'm going to throw this over to Jake Neese too. He's the other Dr. Neese from Chemical Engineering who's been um, supporting us in engineering. I'm going to throw it over to him for some best practice. I wasn't on the list. What? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, thanks. Yeah, I guess that's, I, I don't have a whole lot to offer other than Greg. I think we've, we've done a lot of survey data. We've, lot, we've talked to a lot of people. We do, um, at least Greg and I, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, believe that a live interactive session is still important and still highly valued. Um, and if you would care to tell me I'm wrong, then I would love to know because it, it, it affects people's preparation. Um, that said, to be able to schedule, to be able to to have that kind of live session is is going to be important, and then obviously to be able to um, record and put all that up online after the fact, so that someone with internet connectivity issues, somebody that is living in a different time zone, somebody that uh, maybe has some some commitments, coronavirus related or otherwise, that prevent them from being able to access the material. I think a lot of the the best profs and the faculty, which are, are on the screen in front of me right now, have been taking efforts to, to put their content online and to make things accessible kind of around the clock anyway. And for that reason, I feel like a lot of us are pretty well equipped to do that. Um, testing is always gonna be sketchy. I'll leave that uh, until the point on, on reducing stress with assessments, but to Greg's point, I think that the idea of having some more kind of assignment-based assessments, um, little content creation sort of thing is fine, but at the same time, we have to be cognizant of screen time burnout. Uh, we have talked at length about um, trying to prevent people from being in front of a computer screen in a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting or something for 10 hours a day because that uh, it, it can wear you down pretty quickly. So anyway, I don't really know if I add anything. But... That's great, thank you. Thanks, Jake and Michelle. Um, so I'll move on to the second question, unless anybody else has anything to, to say about that. Are we going to discuss labs as well, how we do labs? Uh, yep, yeah, that's one of the questions that, uh, that was submitted as well. So we'll get to the lab, so to the lab related questions. Um, okay, so going on to the second question, how will you be replacing the in-person experience in your course? So um, I'll, I'm happy to, to start. I, I, I think it, it'll, it'll certainly be a little different um, for everybody depending on, uh, on, on the course you're in. But uh, so at least in the first year, so uh, Dr. Sask and I, the, the three modules of the course, you have your lecture, your lab, and your design studio. Um, we'll, we'll be taking the same approach that Dr. Neese and Dr. Wool uh, spoke of earlier by having live scheduled time. Uh, so the platform we'll be using is Microsoft Teams, and you will have uh, lectures will take place uh, in an assigned team that you'll be added to. Um, but then when you're working on your various lab activities and projects, you'll be working, you'll also be working in, uh, in, in a team, except the focus there 
will be in breakout rooms. So rather than trying to cram all of you in a whole bunch of rectangles here on the screen, uh, a lot of your time is going to be spent working in a smaller group of four. Um, you'll have access to a, to a TA or an instructional assistant who will regularly pop in on those meetings to help you out, answer any kind of questions you have. Um, so, I mean, really what, what we, what our intention is in first year for 1P10 specifically is to create a high touch experience. So even though it won't be in person, there's going to be a lot of support for you. Um, and you're not going to feel like you're, you're in this, in this large, um, collage of, of different faces. It, it's really going to intended to be a smaller in per, virtual, uh, in touch experience. Okay, thank you, Colin. Um, I'll move on to the third question. So what have the fourth year courses done to reduce COVID-19 stress on students? For example, exams converted to assignments, asynchronous, posted in-class Q&A, lab experience, um, uh, HESI 3E06. So these are just some of the examples. So we can have pretty much any fourth year instructor or co-director answer this question. Okay, I'll start with that. I'm not speaking for other instructors as well, but one of the issues we're very worried about stress in this whole online experience or virtual experience. So one of the things about exams is looking at saying less of the formal kind of exam, but it's up to individual instructors, but more on, this, on the side of assignments rather than uh, examinations, whether it be midterms or finals. And that's sort of a thing up in the air at the moment. In laboratories, uh, obviously you're going to miss the, the, the in-person laboratory experience. But in my case, for instance, for F04, I'm going to be videoing the attachment of electrodes to a subject and recording data from the brain or the heart or whatever else uh, that we work with. And then with the students, giving that to students online, uh, we are going to be recording, as Jake said and as Greg said, as we give live synchronous lectures, we'll be recording those so people can read the, can look at them offline again when they want to have reinforcement or they weren't able to make it at that time. Hopefully that'll reduce some stress. And posting all our stuff on the, pro, the our common medium, which is Avenue to Learn, which we've done in the past already. So the laboratory experience is trying to give you, instead of the in-person, is give you the data and then you can work with the data later and you can still write up your lab reports, et cetera, and all the rest, this kind of thing. So I'll leave it to one of my colleagues. So Huber makes a good point about using Avenue to Learn. Is that one thing that we can do to help reduce stress uh, together for everybody is to just take a unified approach, uh, to not have a thousand different web streaming platforms. I don't think there are a thousand, but you get my meaning, uh, and a whole bunch of different places to post your content. Uh, one thing that, that came up in the winter term when, when a lot of us were teaching winter courses is, well, you start, you move to your, your Microsoft Teams or something, and then you start putting announcements on there because there's that like channel that you can just like say, hey, you know, heads up, there's an extra tutorial assignment, but you don't put that on Avenue. And that kind of inconsistency is very frustrating for everybody, especially for the students, but also even just for us, if you want people to see something and then they say they don't see it, it's, it's frustrating for everybody. So... Uh, having that unified approach is going to be critical. And then the last thing I'll say is that I think as fourth year, like particularly for the fourth year instructors, we have a bit of an advantage of, of being able to plan for this. I think something that happened in the winter term where everybody was kind of spinning their wheels and trying to figure out something on the fly, but now we have the ability to very thoughtfully and methodically plan and design the assessments and, and the course structure. Um, to be able to hopefully reduce stress as much as possible. I don't have any specific like panaceas to, to do that sort of thing. But, but I think that everybody should be, um, maybe feel a little bit better about that. I'm confident talking with other people making their courses. I'm confident that people are planning for the best way forward. So. You know, for my part, um, aside from the, the obvious stuff that we've been talking about, keeping the platforms consistent, et cetera, one thing that I like to do uh, right before my lecture is about a half an hour before the lecture, I, I try to open it up for you guys to have some time to catch up with your buddies and uh, just share your experiences. It's, it's sort of like what happens when you walk into the classroom before the lecture gets started. You have a chance to hang out and talk to people. The other thing I'm doing is making sure that I'm more available to you so that 
Um, there will be office hours, which will be sort of an open format where you can, as a group, come and ask questions. Uh, but then there will also be chances to meet with me individually whenever you need it. And I've uh, extended my, my schedule and my time so that if you're in a very far away place, let's say you're living currently in China, um, I will adapt my schedule so that you can meet with me not at four in the morning. We'll be doing it so that we're both at a time that we can both be uh, sharp and aware of what we're doing. So I, I hope that helps you guys. That's great. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Ken. Um, so I'll move on to the next question. Um, how will assessments occur this fall term for IBEHS courses? This includes mid midterms, exams, and design project deliverables. Any invigilation? There's a couple questions in there. <laughs> so I, I, I can certainly start in terms of, so with, with 1P10, uh, we, uh, we won't be using proctoring. Um, it, it doesn't mean you're not going to encounter that. Um, you might. It, it's the university is is kind of working on testing some tools that um, that that make the most sense. And, and um, in in terms of in terms of one P ten, um, because it is a very much project based uh, course. Is that uh, I mean a number of a number of those project deliverables will involve some type of, of virtual prototype. Uh, you'll have lots of opportunities to, to, to build rough prototypes from your own home. Um, but in, in terms of kind of that final deliverable that we will give you and we will afford you the tools to actually do it virtually. And so one way that we're going to do that um, is that you will, uh, we will give you access to purchase a Raspberry Pi uh, which you can connect to your network and then you can act, you'll actually, we'll set, we'll help you get set up with certain software to run certain virtual simulations, uh, which directly relate to your projects. Um, in terms of the uh, other, uh, other midterms and exams in 1P10, I mean, we ran them, we ran them last, last, uh, last winter, as Dr. Nice correctly pointed out, we had a bit of, we, we, we got a, we learned a lot in, in that short time. And so, um, we were able to administer the exams quite successfully without any, any need for proctoring or anything like that. Perfect. Thank you, Colin. Um, so the next question, uh, will lectures be made mandatory to attend live? Other courses have decided to just upload all the lectures for the week at the beginning of the week, which I have come to enjoy with the shift to online learning. So I can, uh, <clears throat> I'll take that one. And yes, all of my lectures are going to be mandatory. Uh, I think the set schedule is uh, already out. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I just, I mean, I can't speak for all instructors, uh, but I can tell you that. So some of the feedback, first of all, that we have, and we've talked about this a little bit already um, in this question and answer period is that um, feedback from students is that they um, they have found, at least in that little transition at the end of March uh, and into April, is that they preferred some of the live interaction um, and not just the posting of the lectures. And they found that the scheduling of getting the information was challenging when people just posted um, posted pre-recorded lectures. So a, a lot of a lot of us are planning to do the lectures live or synchronous. Um, I, recognizing that. Um, especially if you're you know, living, living in another country and around the world in a different time zone, um, that uh, that may be a challenge. And, uh, and there's, other, there's other complications with, with um, maybe um, streaming of the information and, and internet bandwidth and what have you. So I know that I'm not going to be making my lectures mandatory. Um, there will certainly be, I'm going to be striving to, to give assessments that try to, you know, work with student participation and understanding of the material. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily have to be live within the lecture period um, and the, the scheduled lecture time. But I will still be having my interaction, my, my, my interactions that are specifically at the time that they're slotted at um, to help keep a schedule um, and then saving those lectures afterwards. Uh, there are some other things that may be a little bit more challenging in terms of the timing and that they may have to occur at a certain time, especially if they're group work. Um, uh, but I won't be having my, my lectures mandatory for sure. So 
I don't know if anyone else had a thing that they wanted to, uh, any thing they wanted to add to that where they need some sort of mandatory interaction at a set time. Well, you know, my labs will be something that uh, uh, I will need students in the space, but, uh, and I hope that people come to my lectures because they tend to, to uh, work with a, a dialogue rather than a, just a one-way stream of data. So the more people we have in a lecture, the, the more, the better quality we have out of the experience. So I hope that you guys will find the, the topics interesting enough to want to attend them. But I do put them online after, after we have our class to make sure that if you miss something or if there's a technical problem and you lose contact, you have a way to catch up on anything you might have missed. Perfect. Did like Jake has else something. Has, yeah. Yeah, really quick. Actually, off of what Ken is saying, this is just a this is just a, a PSA. Is like one way for the students, in my opinion, to make class more enjoyable for their own colleagues and then also for us and to make things better is to, and it's going to take an effort, right? But is to be consciously aware that your engagement really does make the classroom experience, even the virtual classroom experience, better. Uh, and therefore your attendance is not required, but encouraged. And then more to that, like I teach very much like Ken, I'm very back and forth, at least that's the way I prefer to do it. And we might need to make some changes, but if you, if, if there's a bit of a give and take or maybe some in-class workshops, I love doing in-class workshops and example problems. Like if people are willing to discuss those in breakout rooms or in the chat, I think that would go a long way to make everybody's class experience a lot better. Perfect. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Greg. Um, so we're going to move on to some lab related questions uh, that were submitted. Uh, so the first question, how will, how will courses with lab components be completed? So we can have either uh, Mike answer or Vince. Well, I guess I'll start. Um, so uh, now I'm teaching medical imaging in the winter. Uh, we don't know what winter is going to bring yet, but hopefully we'll be uh, either partly back to normal or we may just be continuing on with what we're doing in the fall. So uh, I'm just planning that it's just gonna go on. So, uh, and uh, in, in terms of that, uh, the labs um, in teaching medical imaging, the labs we're going to do would be um, actually doing imaging in real time and um, having students watch either myself or the TA actually do actually some imaging work. Um, I had um, kind of uh, adapted at the end of the winter term already for my electrical engineering imaging course, and I created some videos on the fly uh, using a human MRI system. So with the uh, iBiomed 4DO3, we're not able to take 140, 150 students through a human imaging system. So the good thing is I've got those videos already and I can easily make more anytime. So I've got another movie I'm about to put together on uh, when I actually did some cardiac imaging of, uh, of someone. So, um, so these are all like, you know, you can watch them any old time videos, uh, but the actual, um, labs where we'll be getting data for students to analyze. That'll be all done in real time. Uh, and uh, what I want to have from the students is uh, them telling me, okay, put the sample here or change this value on the machine. We do have some small uh, CT scanners. They're not, they're not um, x-ray based, they're optical based, but I can certainly uh, make them work great, no problem for me, but I wanna hear students in a lab say, oh, change that value for me now, and I'll just do it, just like um, just running the, running the machine. I, I won't say, why would you, you know, I, this is wrong. I'm just gonna let you do it, and we'll get bad values. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, I'm, like I try to tell my grad students, break it, because if you break it, you'll learn something. Um, so um, that's the way I'm going to do imaging labs. Imaging is very hands-on, and some of it, I mean, we've got a bunch of ultrasound transducers as well, and if you want to talk about hands-on getting close, you can't distance yourself two meters when you're doing ultrasound on someone. You're actually right there. So um, um, if we're in the situation where we are still distancing, I will have uh, one of the TAs and I will have the transducer. I know how to image anything with ultrasound and I'll just let the students uh, guide me. Okay, I'll just say, here I am. What do you want me to do? 
Okay. Okay. Put it here. Oh, well, that's a terrible image, right? Looks like bone. Okay. Garbage, right? So, um, uh, so any students, yeah, there you go, Greg. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll do transcranial on you. That'd be beauty. Um, uh, and and skull. <laughs> so, um, um, and uh, yeah, I will just try to be a, a, fl a flimsy arm just doing what I'm told to do. So, um, so that's my plan. Um, so in terms of interaction, those labs will definitely need the students watching if we're going down that route, watching exactly what I am doing or the TA is doing. And uh, we will be, we'll be basically the robot being guided along. So that's, that's how we're gonna do that. Perfect, thank you, Mike. Um, okay, so next question, how will design yeah, projects work first. virtually? Gonna ask something. Sorry? Uh, uh, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Alessandra? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, well, Hubert. One of the things Mike brought up it was the idea of uh, using your lab as a recording studio and doing the experiment there, interacting you with the people on a Zoom basis or a Teams basis. So you can, people can ask questions could you try this or you can demonstrate things uh, as you go through it. Then the data gets recorded and the student gets the, the recorded data and then works with it offline to develop their lab report and to understand it. But we'd like the idea of bringing up and making it a real live experience. The, un the only thing is the student won't be there putting them on themselves. It'll be myself and a TA or uh, doing the, each experiment. So yeah, it's good, you'll, you'll still have the ability to actually interact during that laboratory session, the recording session. Yeah, and I'll just add to this, um, Hubert, one thing just to let everybody know, um, uh, my lab's in a hospital and I'm staff at the hospital. so my own grad students can't go to the lab. So what I've been doing with them is we do a lot of electronics work. They do all the electronics um, uh, maybe at home and uh, they can, I've got a tunnel set through our firewall into the hospital called the DMZ. So the students, my grad students remotely log on to the MRI. I'm sitting in front of the MRI. I got my grad student looking at me and the MRI via Zoom and I'm just typing on the console right so they're remotely logged on changing some of the background files but they can't actually put anything into the MRI so that's what I do so I've been doing that as kind of like uh, you know their robot so they can in fact get their graduate work done okay perfect thank you um, so we'll go on to the next question. How will design projects work virtually? Will there be will there still be lots of group work? So anybody with design projects who wants to answer the question or uh, I can get started first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my, my name is Fagan, and uh, I'm teaching the course for PO4 in September. So. 4 pill 4 is a course we teach uh, economics, like uh, knowledge, like uh, project management through all the products. So the way we're going to handle the virtualized uh, design studio is going to be on Teams. We're going to have a breakout rooms for each small group. And uh, also, as uh, Dr. Owen mentioned before, so we're also going to facilitate uh, the, your availability. If you different students join from different time zone, we're gonna try to coordinate the timing. So other than that, so TAs and the community partners gonna join as well, basically in live. So the idea is that, uh, so if you have any question group work, we can facilitate at the same time. So uh, that's pretty much it for me. And uh, also I'm uh, gonna have, um, a simulation tool, something we're gonna be using from a smart sense, smart uh, things. We're gonna try to get uh, simulation uh, like uh, as a tool to engage the teamwork for the design studio. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Sean. Yeah. So, uh, hey, folks. Sean Park, instructor for Two EO Six. Uh, our course is uh, human centered design. Uh, there will be group projects throughout the year. Uh, we will have a uh, um, a sponsor, so a, um, you get a sort of a community partner. Uh, so students are going to be sort of paired with with community partner to do things like interviews uh, and conversations, and that'll be done in groups. And we um, are going to use, uh, as we've done before, uh, visual collaboration tools uh, to to sort of assist with 
uh, doing uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, uh, design uh, design work. Um, and uh, we're going to use uh, Teams. We're going to use sort of some of the breakouts uh, uh, functions on Teams, um, uh, just like it's been said before with some courses that during the, the live uh, portion of the course, uh, a lot of the work will be done um, in groups during that time. Uh, so yeah, lots of group work, folks. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, so next question, uh, mm -hmm. this is- Janie has something to add, Alessandra. Sorry, Janie, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Everybody, okay. yeah. Go ahead, Janie. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. Um, so I'm Janie Wilson. I'm one of the co-instructors of 3P04, which is uh, the third year design course for health solutions. Um, very similar to the other things that were mentioned, but I just wanted to also add that um, we will be continuing with the hands-on component of the design course in a team-based format. So um, for students, uh, if, if we are virtual for 3P04, we will be sending out kits that will include a lot of the sensors and electronics that they need. Every individual within the team will receive the kit so that they can work on it together, but also have that hands-on experience at home. Um, and similarly, we'll have um, our TAs available and faculty mentors available um, for drop-in sessions for Design Studio to kind of work with the teams through some of the, um, the solutions that they're doing as well. Okay, so uh, I'm Qin Fang Nat. I'm also a co-instructor uh, for the co-instructor for 3 po 4 That uh, this is a, a third-year course that uh, we're targeting mostly motion-based uh, sensing systems not uh, on the technology side, but uh, Dr. Wilson will arrange uh, a number of uh, mentors on the clinical side, first uh, to cover some of the basic uh, uh, problems, clinical problems in order for you to uh, establish the problem statement and then therefore that you can proceed to design. So we actually prefer that those type of interactions are mostly will be live and therefore that we will allow everybody to actually participate in this type of question and answer sessions. We will be trying to be flexible in terms of uh, arranging the time. And uh, we basically, the, the breakout room uh, format are very similar, even that uh, uh, without uh, the COVID-19 that we have done that in the past uh, semester and then worked out uh, very well. And uh, as for the, as for the hands-on component, well, we actually still uh, have a very strong hands-on component at, uh, in this design project. At, uh, the final, thing, luckily we're in the winter term, therefore that uh, there's some uncertainty uh, involved in whether we're going to be completely uh, remote. And in the meantime, we're prepared for both scenarios. And uh, for the first scenario, uh, one of the components is that uh, everybody will do their own project. That's straightforward. We're going to actually prepare a kit, and then you can actually do it at home. And for the group component, uh, for hands-on, we are still in the process of trying to figure out how to do that yet. And uh, in the case of that, we have to do it remotely. So that uh, we will let you, uh, we'll keep you posted on the progress. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so last question before we open it up to uh, the students to ask any questions. Um, so this is specific to anatomy. Um, since anatomy is online, will students have any opportunities to get any hands on experience um, in the labs, even if it, it's in the future. So I think um, Alana if she's Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay. Alana. I'm the course coordinator uh, for anatomy for iBiomed and health sciences. And so we know that getting into our physical lab space is one of the really attractive features of our course. And, you know, fortunately we're having to move our labs and tutorials online. A lot will depend on what the winter looks like. If we're able to get in for some things in the winter, then we'll be looking at possibly incorporating some hands-on lab time um, in a probably reduced format because we still may have to bring in a small number of students at a time, but looking at a way to incorporate some hands-on activity there. If we are online for the entire academic year, then we will be looking at what other opportunities are there for you once we're allowed to be back in that lab space. And we're just going to have to sort of assess um, timelines and see what we're allowed, but that will be communicated out through your program to let you know what opportunities there are. 
And I'm also happy if you want me to take a moment to speak about what our structure of our course is going to be like for the fall term. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so now we'll open the webinar to the students uh, who mo may pose any questions in the chat. Unless I'm not seeing it. <clears throat> what will the structure of anatomy look like? Okay, so the structure of anatomy, uh, we have multiple components. We are pre-recording our lectures, but there will be some time through our virtual time slot, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays around the lunch hours, our scheduled time slot, where we will be having probably on a bi-weekly or what, at least once a month basis, where we have creative time to, and creative ways to interact with the faculty. So we're playing around with some different ideas. There might be a talk show where you get to ask faculty your questions. So a way to sort of connect with your faculty because we won't be doing that through the lectures. Our labs and tutorials will be online. We alternate labs and tutorials bi-weekly. So week one you have lab, week two you have tutorial. This year for the fall offering, we are breaking all the students down into small groups and they will have a TA assigned to their specific group. And they will be with that TA and that student group for labs and tutorials. And there'll be live sessions, which will be probably about an hour long each week, paired with asynchronous activities that students will do on their own or in small lab groups. For our assessments, we are looking at, instead of having one midterm and one final exam, we are doing a smaller, lower weight assessments. So we are looking at having modular tests, and this is really to help reduce the stress in terms of how much content you need to study per test, as well as a way to keep you on track throughout the term. Our final exam is being reduced down to 25% and will still be an online bell ringer exam. And we are also looking at participation and assessments through lab and tutorial activities as well. Your TAs uh, and myself as well will be available for online office hours and with me as well, you can also always book a time to set up a meeting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so another question, um, will timings for exams differ for international students? Um, so maybe I can, uh, <clears throat> that's a challenging one. And, uh, you know, so, um, uh, so one of the ways to, to try and get around this is to, uh, is to do other assessments that, um, that aren't specifically like exams. So, so more um, assignment based assessments or things like that. Um, you know, I, I suppose another way of doing it is to have different versioning of exams. Um, that's a, certainly a possibility, but you can imagine that uh, you know the internet works basically almost instantaneously, and so somebody who's writing an exam 12 hours after um, another student, possibly, um, then the conversion of that information can go right across, and and so so making sure that there's um, things like different types of assessments for the students is the plan, the way I plan to do it, and to to also find out where where everyone is and when they're when they're able to engage the class or to if, if I'm running a test type scenario um, when they're going to be able to, to try and, and, and work in that. I don't know if there are other instructors who have some input on that or thoughts on that. No thoughts? <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, I have a next question here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what will HESI 3E06 look like with respect to hospital rounds? <clears throat> okay, so that's me. I was hoping somebody would ask. I was going to ask my own question and answer it. Um, so the, the clinical placements are a really big draw for 3E06, and I know that there's a lot of anxiety around this. We are not going to force you to go into hospitals. That's probably the most dangerous place to put you right now. So your health and safety is our first priority but also a priority are the experiential learning experience. 
experiences. Uh, so uh, suffice it to say for now that there are a number of people on this call working really hard to make sure that you do not miss out on the hospital rounds clinical placements opportunity. Um, so those going into level three, don't worry. Um, we will be communicating with you specifically soon on, on a, a plan that we have in place. Okay, thank you, Anna. Okay, next question. Next question yep. is, a lot of fourth year electrical engineering students have been looking forward to ELEC-ENG 4BE4 medical robotics as an IBEHS tech elective. When can we expect the course to be up and running? Right. <laughs> I'll try to answer that one. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. It depends upon the instructor, and I cannot give you a definite answer that's going to be up and running this fall or the winter term. Uh, the, the person who teaches that one certainly still a, is still a member of the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, um, and it depends upon the demand of the course and upon his own teaching load. But I'll I'll pass it on to the Electrical Engineering Department to uh, to inquire about that. If there's a lot of interest, then it's certainly worthwhile to have it as the elective or when the elective is going to be given. You can't say for sure. Okay, thank you. The next one is, although not entirely related to COVID, for IBEHS 4QZ3, I noticed that IBEHS 4CO3 is a prerequisite. However, some streams, HESI and ENGFIS, do not take this course according to the academic calendar. Would students be required to take 4C3 or 4CO3 as a technical elective? So I'm going to jump in and at least introduce myself. I'm the course instructor for 4CO3, Carol Basim, um, Statistical Methods in Biomedical Engineering. And I know that I've been working closely with Dr. Noseworthy um, for the 4Z class uh, uh, to make sure that our two two classes are compatible and building on each other. However, I don't know the answer to this. Do, do the administrators or course directors? And I know we have been talking about this as well. Yeah, we've, we've been discussing that as an issue in, in our uh, curriculum uh, design and it hasn't come down on paper yet, since we're not modifying it yet, but I think you one would be strongly encouraged to take that as a technical elective, because it would certainly help out in 4Qz3. And since engineering physics has changed its uh, statistics course, um, certainly help as well there. So we've been discussing that for some time yet. We haven't come down to a guideline yet, but when it comes down to student advising, uh, you should contact your student advisor to see what should they do in this case. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just um, I'll add a little bit of clarification in terms of um, in in terms of eng phys because that, that was the other that was the other tail to the question. So um, the students who who would be taking um, the students who would be taking four QZ three next year is uh, you'll be covered because you'll have had a uh, a, you'll have taken a stats course, however many years ago that was. Um, so you're going to have the statistics content. Um, and yeah, it, to, to Dr. Boone's point, for the for the HESI students, is that uh, Carol and Dr. Dr. Noseworthy are 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 syncing up those two courses so that um, you're not going to be left behind when you when you get into the uh, the Queasy course. So I have a comment on the entry uh, prerequisite. Just for this coming year, that is actually the only year that uh, I think 4303 that is equivalent to the 2W03, which I taught uh, a couple of years ago when you guys in the first uh, uh, second year cohort. Uh, I think it's uh, because of us 4303 is a prerequisite and then they, they may not completely 100% overlap with uh, 2W. And it may be helpful that uh, for you guys, the coming four years cohort in ENFIS, to just take a look at the curriculum and uh, the course outlines in 403, and then maybe identify a few things to fresh up. That uh, I think for this coming year, that uh, you should be okay. Thank you. 
So the next question we have is, can you also give info on 4EI3 and whether it will be available for ENG students in the coming term? Uh, so that's that's for me too. Uh, so 4EI3, we ran for the first time this summer and we are considering running it again in the fall for, for both HESI and engineering students if there's interest and, and if that, that works out for everyone. Awesome, thank you. Um, is there any changes on the TA application for anatomy due to COVID? So there is no change on the application process. We had to delay doing our TA interviews because we needed first to figure out what type of delivery we were doing for the fall term and what the TA roles and responsibilities will be. So that process is going to be getting underway shortly. And so that information will be communicated out to applicants. Thank you. Okay, so um, another question. Um, as a student uh, with bad internet, what are my best options for online classes? Maybe Greg can answer that. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, so um, I think, like I said earlier, I mean, we're aware that um, that not everyone has high speed internet and uh, or super high speed internet, and and there's there's challenges. It goes up and down. In fact, even even when we're in meetings, uh, faculty and staff meetings, uh, some of us will will lose uh, connectivity or bandwidth. We'll run into bandwidth issues. So we're very much aware of that, and and I think the you know, like I said, I, we're going to plan to run synchronous interactions, and that means so live interactions. Um, that can mean that we're video streaming, but it can also mean like so chat rooms on on Avenue to Learn or in in Microsoft Teams um, on these platforms. It doesn't have to mean that you're always streaming, and uh, and we're going to be recording our live lectures and interactions and uploading those recordings as well. Um, or giving you links to them um, so that you, you know, if you have internet connectivity issues, you'll be able to catch up on that information as well. And, um, you know, keeping on with the chat side of things uh, as well, so at live interactions. And then if you need to, you know, we can have, uh, I think Ken touched on this uh, really good point, is that, you know, additional hours for you to interact with us outside of the, you know, the, the standard hours um, that don't have to be video driven um, either through chat on Avenue or um, uh, um, just an audio audio discussion or so. Does that, does that help? Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so next question. Is it possible to fit a course in level three if it does not exceed the maximum amount of courses taken during the semester? Maybe Sina, if she's there to answer. So I can, uh, I, oh, Sina, are you ready? Okay, good, yeah. Sorry, I was just looking at something. What was the question again? <laughs> no problem. Um, is it possible to fit a course in level three if it does not exceed the maximum amount of courses taken during the semester? Gotcha, okay. Um, the answer to that, and maybe Greg will want to jump in after me, because I know he is all ready to answer that question. <laughs> um, but simply, if it works into your schedule, the answer is yes. The only things that you do have to watch out for, obviously, is prerequisites to make sure that the prerequisites, you do uh, meet all the prerequisites. But you also have to be careful that uh, you don't exceed 40 units between your fall and winter term. And you can also not exceed 21 units in any given term. So you can't go over 21 units in fall or winter and you can't go over 40 overall. So as long as the extra course that you're looking to take fits into that and you meet the prerequisites and you don't have any conflicts with your schedule, then yes, you would be able to take it. I don't know if Greg has anything else he would like to add on top of that. No, perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Sina. Thank you, Sina. Um, okay, so another question. Um, Will first year schedules be kept assigned or will they have some flexibility? <laughs> Sina, since you're not muted, you can answer this. So uh, first year schedules, yes, they will be assigned and they are not flexible. Students have to stick to the schedule that they are being given. Um, the only sense of flexibility that they have is if they wish to lighten their load at all. So say, for example, if they want to take 
any of the math courses, chemistry or physics in the summer, then they need to talk to their advisor and look about how they can move that into the summer to help lighten their loads. Um, the only other flexibility you have is that you get, do get to choose a one complementary studies elective. It can be in either term and it does have to fit into the schedule that you're being given. Thanks, Sina. So we have another question here. I have Biomed recently announced an accelerated BME Masters for Students. What will the application process be like? Okay, that's um, probably me. That's the best to uh, answer that. Since um, uh, I'm currently the co-director of the School of Biomedical Engineering, but that's only for another eight days. Um, but I do know the procedure that we put together for that. So the whole thing works like this. Um, if you're interested in doing an accelerated master's, um, you would then uh, approach a professor that uh, is a member of the School of Biomedical Engineering and uh, someone that uh, maybe you've uh, run into in the iBiomed program. And right now we're working on also uh, approaching people in uh, the Faculty of Health Sciences who are not members of iBiomed to, or not members of BME to join. Um, then you would um, take either, you need to have one 600 level course uh, in your last year of undergrad. So it could be either instrumentation, which is Dr. De Bruyne's course, or it could be 4QZ3, which is mathematical modeling, which is my course. And uh, you take those at the 600 level. So you would inform um, your uh, advisor uh, for iBiomed that that's your intent. And uh, you found a potential professor that's interested in taking you on as an accelerated master's student. So you take one of those courses at 600 level. Then the, the summer between fourth year and fifth year, you work in that professor's lab and get paid for it um, as a summer research assistant. And um, you're not classified as a graduate student yet. You're working, however, on a project that would be whatever your master's is going to is because that's now your project. So then you, you work one semester on that, you uh, come back to your fifth year, and then uh, you return to do um, three semesters um, uh, now as a graduate student. Uh, uh, so this would be your sixth year of education, uh, would be one year master. So you've already covered one year or one semester in research in the summer before. You have one 600 level course. Now you need three um, semesters uh, in research uh, and, um, and then two 700 level courses. One of them would have to be one of our core courses, so BME 701 or BME 706, which is, um, it's 701 if you, it's like, um, it's, uh, uh, it's engineering fundamentals for people with a biology background, and 706 is the bio side of biomedical engineering fundamentals for people with an engineering background. So that's, that's kind of how that would work. And then you'd have so you have to take one core course and then one other 700 level course. And that, that's, that's how that would work. So hopefully that made sense. Great, thanks Mike. Um, okay, so another couple questions before uh, time is up. Um, what will determine when things go back to normal? Can you speak to what plans exist or are being considered? I've heard that all courses will have an online option for the foreseeable future. Greg. <laughs> sure. So, so we're, we're bound by, number one, what the government says, um, and then what the university says. And, uh, and so we, we would, you know, I think all, all of us would like to have the students in person and in classes because the experience, the in-person experience, uh, we feel uh, and the feedback we get from the students is that that is by far the best experience and it's clear for labs and other experiential components and, and projects. Um, so, but we have to follow the regulations based on the risk associated with the COVID-19 situation and so we can't push forward to have any of our courses in person until we get the go-ahead. Um, so, you know, the, the I, I think that there's been we're still wondering whether or not it's going to happen for the winter term. Um, there are, of course, challenges of, of kicking everything back in in the winter term. If we suddenly suddenly turn in and, and then, yes, we're, we're all in person for the winter term and getting everyone back in. Um, so those, those things, those deliberations are still happening um, at the university level. And we can't 
have that happen, we can't bring students in until we get approval to do that. So, but uh, as soon as we can, we'll get we'll we'll get everyone in. And I'd say, yeah, I would I would guess that we'd be back in person uh, in September for sure, September two thousand and and twenty one. Um, but then again, if you would ask me um, in December of 2019, if we were going to be doing all this online, I would have said, you're crazy. So. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Greg. Um, so last question uh, before we end with our closing remarks. Um, since everything is online, can we take a course as a visiting student on an LOP at another institution while also taking courses at Mac in the fall? So the easy answer to that is yes. You need to get permission and we have to make sure, so especially um, on the engineering side, we have to make sure of equivalence, um, but also I'm pretty sure, I'm, Michelle, on the, on the HESI side, uh, uh, but so any course that you would take at another institution we have to make sure that it actually um, is equivalent to the course that you would take or the course that it's going to replace um, back here at McMaster University. And so before you decide to do that, please make sure that you talk to to Sinan, to Sina or, sorry, so I was gonna say Brennan as well, but Sina or Brennan, um, so, um, or to the, the to, to any of the co-directors, um, and we can, we can work you through that to make sure that any course you're planning on taking actually has equivalence and that you'll get credit for it. The other thing, by the way, that if you take a course on letter of permission at another university, you need at least a C minus, in order to get credit for it. And when you get the credit transfer, just a to, to, just to note that any, any, any grade you get in that course, it comes across as a transfer credit. So if you get an A plus, it comes across as a credit, period. If you get a C minus, it also comes across as a credit and it has no effect on your GPA. So um, positive or negative. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, so that's pretty much it for uh, the time that we have for the webinar. Um, just to let you all know that the recording of this webinar will be posted to our Avenue page and we will have an FAQ article uh, posted to our website. Um, so thank you all for attending and participating in the Mac iBio Med Live webinar today. Uh, thank you especially to our instructors for being here to answer the student inquiries. Um, and a special thanks to all of our students for being here. We hope that this was beneficial to you in answering any questions that you may have for the upcoming fall term. Um, if you still have further questions or concerns, you can email us um, at the ibiomed at mcmaster.ca email, um, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So good luck everyone with your upcoming year, and thank you again for being here. Thanks guys. <laughs>
time or date of when it's going to be fixed. So here we are. Yeah. So definitely challenges for sure. And I think, I mean, I think, you know, the, I think the students concerns around like live lectures and the requirement for live lectures are well founded. And, and you know, so we have just to make sure that we accommodate appropriately. So. Yeah, of course. Um, there was, there was, when we were going through the questions and the, the submitted questions, that was, that was one of the ones that I was like, I need to make sure this one gets asked because addressing like the, the socioeconomic disparities is a huge deal, especially with it all going to a virtual environment, right? You're right. And I, so I, I think, I think generally for the students who are coming to university, there tends to, tends to be less of that than if you're in a public school system. Um, but I agree with you, but I absolutely agree with you that that still is an issue. And, and frankly, you, you don't, it doesn't even have to be socioeconomic. You can have somebody that's living in a relatively urban position. It doesn't matter how much money they throw at it. They still can't get high speed internet. That's very <laughs> true. That's like, like my parents. That's yeah. like, that's very much like my parents. They live in uh, just outside of Smithville and for the longest time we had like a cell phone hub internet because that was the only way to get high speed internet so just a second so marissa i just noticed that you posted in the chat you don't know how to leave so are you on a computer so what you do is you wave your mouse around and in the bottom right hand corner you should see a little red a uh, button that pops up that says leave and so you can click on that and that will let you leave the meeting or you could just close the close the window and you I can also I can also help you here we go thanks for coming <laughs> okay so Kyle can kick you <laughs> off <laughs> <laughs> there we go so, yeah so there's no question that um, you know what I mean even sitting in in faculty staff meetings you see somebody they'll be they'll be they'll be talking um and then all of a sudden they they or they're giving a presentation and they they suddenly get fuzzy they're gone. and they're, <laughs> they're gone and so yeah. you know what happens to us too so you're absolutely right and, and i mean 